<laughs> All right. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here at the 16th online Didsbury Sidebar. Our uh, speaker tonight is Dr. Emma Liu from the University College of London, and I believe she's done several sidebars before. Um, she's going to talk to us about how drones are changing the way we look at, uh, we study volcanoes. So thank you, Emma. Looking forward to it. Over to you. All right, let me share my screen. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so today we are going above and beyond. So we are going to talk about how drones are giving us a bird's eye view of the earth, but we're going beyond that in the drones are offering us a way that we can take tangible scientific measurements. We can go beyond simply imagery, uh, taking photographs, videos, nice as they are, but we can use this technology to improve volcano monitoring and have tangible impact in some of even the world's most developing countries. So over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through some of the, the applications of, of drones to earth observation, to volcanology in particular, and then we're going to spend most of the talk talking about my particular speciality, which is volcanic gas measurements. So science is often driven by technological advances, whether that be the new mass spectrometer or a new isotope system. And drones have really crept into science over the last decade. They began as being a tool for us to make in situ observations, to create topographic models from imagery, but really, the reason why they've created such step changes in the way we do science in, in geoscience is because we often deal with large scale study areas, tens to hundreds of kilometers squared. We often deal with inaccessible locations and volcanology is particularly susceptible to that. And also time varying phenomena where we want to make repeat observations of geophysical or geochemical parameters uh, in the natural world. And drones really allow us, they give us a tool to be able to do this. So this is really why this technology has, has stuck. Narrowing down into volcanology in particular, they've been having a, a really tangible impact for volcano monitoring particularly. And as you'll see as we go through the talk, we are working with volcano observatories around the world to try and translate some of this technology that we've developed in, in university institutes, with commercial drone uh, collaborators. Uh, and actually these techniques are now being deployed in an operational capacity in places from Hawaii to Papua New Guinea. So let's think for a moment about why we need to monitor volcanic hazards. Let's take a step back and think, how, do, how can they impact society in our environment? So on the right hand side is a, a short animation from the Smithsonian Natural Museum of Natural History. And if, if you haven't seen this, this animation before, I encourage you to, to have a look at it in more detail. It's called Eruptions, Earthquakes and Emissions. And it's basically a timeline. I've, I've shown a snapshot here, but it goes back all the way from 1950 to present, showing the location and timings of earthquakes, of volcanoes, and there are various other layers that you, you can add on here. I always show this at the start of my lectures because it provides uh, really great context, but you can see very clearly how the distribution of hazards from earthquakes and volcanoes is not evenly distributed across the globe. They're concentrated in bands or volcanic arcs along the edges of plate boundaries. And in particular, along the western coast of South America, uh, particularly Indonesia, and then Papua New Guinea, which is just off the corner of the right hand side here, which we'll be seeing of a little bit more later in the talk but there's a disproportionate hazard to particular communities. When we're thinking about volcanic hazard, there are various different timescales and intensities over which the hazards operate. So at one end of the spectrum, we have lava flows. Now these often pose a hazard to infrastructure, to roads, to houses, but they often move very slowly. So potentially not so much a hazard to life. Whereas pyroclastic flows at the other end of the spectrum, uh, these are very fast moving, high temperature flows uh, that can move at hurricane speeds down the side of volcanoes. And there's very little warning. Volcanic ash is produced when we have explosive eruptions and magma fragments into tiny pieces. Now the impact from here can be wide ranging. Ash can encircle the globe uh, within less than a day or 48 hours for the largest eruptions. And this can really impact on aviation. 
And then volcanic gases, these are for me the, the silent uh, hazard, if you like, particularly for these open vent degassing volcanoes. So whereas often we think of volcanic hazard as being attached to the explosive eruptions, open vent systems, this is Messiah in Nicaragua, are pumping out gases relatively low level, but all the time. So we had a research program around Messiah volcano looking at the effect of long-term persistent exposure of these communities to volcanic gases such as uh, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, uh, and, and metal species. So there are a range of different hazards that we, we want to, to mitigate against. Vesuvius is probably the, the case example of a society at risk. Uh, this is Naples, it's got a population of around 2 million people. Now Vesuvius has a history of very large, very explosive eruptions, and simulations have shown that to evacuate a city of 2 million would be almost impossible. So this is one of our, our really most well-watched volcanoes for any signs of unrest. But at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. Now, potentially less spectacular, depending on your, your perspective of what spectacular is. These lava fountains are incredible to behold. But this is a, a photo from the 2018 eruption of Lani Estates, where a fissure, a crack in the ground, opened up in the middle of a residential district just like outside my home in London, for example. Um, although a history over geological time of these fissures forming in this region uh, came as rather a surprise to the community, but this is now an entire community, several hundred to thousand people who have been permanently displaced uh, at very short notice. My particular interest is working with communities in the developing country. So this is a, an island called Manam in Papua New Guinea. So a population of around 2000, this island is made up entirely of a volcano. But what I find most rewarding and interesting and engaging about working in these kind of regions is actually working with the local communities to understand the social and cultural factors that really have to come into any kind of uh, evacuation procedures. Now, I'll go into this in more detail, but this community chose to return to Manam despite the, the volcanic risk, the ongoing volcanic risk, because of their strong cultural and traditional ties to island. Um, so crossing borders between social and physical sciences to provide tangible help to, to communities such as this um, is a strand that runs continuously through my research. And we're actually moving towards enabling drone technology into communities such as this uh, to try and, and, and bridge the gap between our campaign measurements where we can visit for maybe a week at a time into long-term monitoring that the community are leading. So the spotlight topics for today, I'm going to move us through how do we monitor volcanoes in detail? What kind of techniques can we use? How are drones in particular advancing um, or augmenting some of these volcano monitoring applications? And then I'm going to be presenting two case studies, one long range high altitude measurements in Papua New Guinea, and then some air quality measurements in Hawaii during the recent 2018 effusive eruption. So we can broadly divide volcano monitoring into six, probably people would argue me to more, but six broad uh, things that we look for when a volcano is showing signs of unrest. So ground deformation is obviously one of the, the key precursors. Uh, not always, but often as magma moves towards the surface, it will cause the ground to inflate. And then during the eruption, as magma is evacuated, the ground will, will begin to deflate again. This is of, often one of the earliest precursors uh, to magma movement beneath a volcano. Seismology, earthquakes, is another key precursor. Now, as magma forces its way to the surface, uh, often brittle breakage of the Earth's crust will uh, induce seismic swarms that we will see migrate from depth up towards the surface. Gas emissions. Uh, now, particularly for open vent emitters where we can measure gases persistently, we actually detect changes in both the flux and chemistry as magma moves towards the surface. And this is dependent on the pressure solubility of, of different gases. Uh, I've got a slide on this in a few, a few slides time to explain a bit more, but we really want to measure the chemistry of, for example, this gas plume that you can see in the slide here. Then we also have things like thermal imaging uh, and acoustic measurements that are really help us to understand the eruption, but often once it's already in progress, so rather than as a precursor. 
And finally, a lot of our understanding of what is likely to happen in the future is dependent on what has happened in the past. And we can use petrology or geochemistry of previously erupted lavas to learn something about what is the, this volcano's uh, previous explosive history? Uh, what can we watch out for? Drones can really help inform these ones here that I've colored. So we can use them to make topographic measurements. We can conduct thermal imagery um, and we can use them to measure in situ gas chemistry. I, I've put in a yellow petrology here because it's pushing in a little bit, but we can actually take in situ samples of the ash uh, erupted during an eruption uh, using little catches on the drones. And this is helping us to understand things like the size distribution of ash. And we can use this to inform hazard assessments for aviation. And overall, let's not discount simple visual observations and situational awareness. There is nothing that can underestimate an eye in the sky. So where drones are fitting into established techniques, uh, this is particularly applied here for, for gas measurements. So we can perform direct sampling, and this is arguably the most traditional way. We can take physical samples of the gases, take them back to the lab, and measure their chemical composition. But clearly the most important time for measuring the gas chemistry and having a timeline here is, is during periods of unrest. And taking physical samples this close uh, may not always be the, the wisest move. At the other end of the spectrum, we have remote sensing. Uh, this is using uh, both polar orbiting and geostationary satellites uh, to take global snapshots of, of the Earth. We can identify volcanoes showing unrest from their, their thermal signature or from the SO2 emissions that they release. But we do have limitations here also. There is an awful lot of atmosphere between a satellite and the volcano. So our detection limits are very high. Often we can only detect the gas emissions from very strongly degassing volcanoes or during eruptions. We're also limited in the types of gases we can detect. So we can only detect sulfur dioxide because it's, it's not present in the background atmosphere. If we want to quantify the carbon dioxide emissions, which is another really strong uh, emission from volcanoes, uh, this is gradually becoming possible with satellites, but the detection limits are still extremely high. So this is where I started to carve a niche. Drones are allowing us to bridge the gap between direct sampling and remote sensing. We can collect physical samples, we can make in situ measurements right up close to the vent, precluding any atmospheric contamination, but from a safe distance of up to 10, 15 kilometers. Drones can come in all different shapes and sizes. You may be most familiar with the, the multi-copter style. Uh, they can range from small multi-copters about this large, up to rather huge beasts uh, of about a meter diameter. Um, these are very good for carrying heavier payloads, for hovering in place for, for measurements over a long period of time, but they have quite limited range. So if we are pushing the boundaries of, of how high we fly or how far, we want to be looking towards these more fixed wing vehicles. Um, these look closer to your traditional aeroplane. Um, they can we're often limited in how much payload, so we've had to put a lot of work into miniaturizing our ground-based sensors, which could be two or three kilograms in weight, down to around 500 grams. So there's been a lot of engineering behind the scenes to, to get these small enough to fly. Um, but as you, you'll see over the course of this talk, we're now able to routinely take measurements at around 10 kilometers distance using uh, fixed wing vehicles like this. So just to take you through briefly, I won't spend too much time on each one, a few of the applications uh, in volcanology before I move on to talking about volcanic gas chemistry in more detail. So topographic models. Now, the process of taking uh, visual imagery at lots of different angles uh, and then using that to create a topographic model, it's called photogrammetry. And drone-based imagery and the fact that every photograph is automatically georeferenced. Uh, makes this photogrammetry process very quick, very easy and very repeatable. So we can actually look at morphological changes in either the growth of a lava dome at the summit, for example, or changes in the, the geometry of different craters. This is Stromboli on the left, a uh, characteristic multi-vent system, very dynamic. And it's so uh, straightforward now to make repeatable measurements that would have otherwise taken several months to create enough imagery to create a single model. We can now do it in a 20 to 40 minute flight. Uh, so this is very valuable. 
It's not just ground deformation that we can measure though. Uh, there is now work in actually being able to create 3D models of the volcanic gas plume. Uh, so this is important for, for looking at how, how quickly gases disperse in the atmosphere, for different shapes of plumes and, and how they uh, interact with topography, for example. Uh, so it's just a, a novel way in that photogrammetry is now being extended to really push the boundaries of, of what we can quantify. Aerial observations are ideal for measuring lava flow properties. These are a couple of examples from uh, Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. So we can combine aerial imagery with feature tracking, image analysis to look at how fast the lava is flowing. During the 2018 uh, eruption that I showed you on the, the second or third slide where the fissure opened up in the housing district, uh, flights for measuring the the flow of the lava velocities, um, these were performed on an almost continuous rotational basis. So a drone team was on uh, rotor shift. So there was always a drone in the air, almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, this was one of the first examples where in a crisis situation, drones were employed as part of the operational response. The topographic models uh, determined from photogrammetry can also feed into lava flow hazard assessment. So if we want to model where a lava flow is likely to go or the probability of the path it will take, uh, we need very accurate digital elevation models down to the centimeter scale. Um, and we also need these models to update repeatedly. As you, as you have a lava flow uh, in place, the topography is going to change and that will influence the next lava flow that comes. Now being able to make repeatable measurements over a short period of time has greatly increased the accuracy of our, our hazard uh, models for, for lava flow descent. Aerial observations are fantastic for geophysical surveys where we need to cover large areas, um, magnetic surveys to reveal subsurface buried geology or thermal surveys for hotspot detection. Now this has been deployed particularly effectively in Iceland uh, over geothermal fields to look at where the, the best locations or the most promising locations for prospecting for geothermal energy. I briefly mentioned this a few slides ago, but collecting samples of volcanic ash, we can learn a huge amount about the size and shape of the particles in the atmosphere and how fast they're deposited. You can imagine that uh, a shard-like ash fragment like this will travel much, much further than a, um, a compact, dense uh, particle. Um, so we can learn a lot about how, far, how different shapes affect their transport in the atmosphere and use that to refine our dispersion models. I used to have a, a nice animation of this open and closing. It's like a little Pac-Man, but we can, we can keep it closed and sealed uh, on the ground and in flight. And then we're in the ash cloud. We can open it up and expose these microscope mounts, which we can then take directly into the scanning electron microscope to, to look at the, these microscopic ash fragments. And finally, uh, my speciality and the focus of the rest of this talk will be an in situ measurements of volcanic gas emissions. So we are interested in both the emission rate, so how, what, what volume of gas is being released, and then it's chemistry. Uh, so for example, the proportion of carbon dioxide to sulfur dioxide. And this is ideal because trying to get up close and personal with this vent uh, would previously have required quite a high level of risk on behalf of the researcher. So volcanoes release huge quantities of volcanic gases into the atmosphere every day. Even when they're not in eruption, they can release gases passively. We call these open vent volcanoes. Measuring the volcanic gas composition can tell us about magma storage and ascent. So we can see at what depth, at what pressure is magma being stored beneath the surface by probing the geochemistry of its emissions. The main gases released by volcanoes are water vapor, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and then halogens like HCl and HF. So to compare passive versus explosive degassing, during eruptions, these may be the most uh, impactful, uh, may have very high intensity uh, hazards associated with them. Um, but essentially the emissions are transient, they're very short-lived. Whereas passive emissions, although potentially lower in magnitude, these happen constantly all the time and we're releasing thousands of tons of gases into the atmosphere every day. From a hazard perspective, passive degassing is actually 
by far the biggest contributor to volcanic gas emissions globally. If you, if you sum up the budgets, and I'll show you the, the, the quantitative data towards the end, but actually passive emissions are the greatest contributor to volcanic genic emissions of carbon dioxide, for example. But we really want to understand uh, the gas chemistry because explosive eruptions are driven by bubbles of gas. So this is a, a scanning electron microscope slice through a pumice. So a really nice light pumice like you might have in the bath is actually full of these tiny bubbles like this. And it's the nucleation and growth of these bubbles that provide the explosive energy for eruptions and fragmentation, so producing volcanic ash. And the chemistry of these bubbles evolves as magma ascends towards the surface. So this provides the basis for using gas emissions for monitoring. It's the solubility of different volatiles or gases at low pressure is pressure dependent. And each gas species has a different solubility. And these solubilities to some degree depend on the magma composition. But if we look at the schematic on the left hand side, do you imagine a batch of magma entering the, the lower to middle crust. It then begins to rise towards the surface because uh, it's, it's volatile rich, it's buoyant compared to the surrounding crust. When the pressure reaches the point at which CO2 becomes no longer soluble in magma, CO2 will start to evolve, uh, exolve to form bubbles. The CO2 is the most insoluble gas species in silicate melts, so it will evolve first. So early bubbles will be CO2 rich. As the magma then continues to rise towards the surface, we get sulfur dioxide exolution into bubbles. So gradually the chemistry of the, the volatile phase or the gas phase will evolve towards more SO2 rich compositions. We then get to the point where water will start to exolve and then finally chlorine and fluorine and the other halogens. But if we have continuous measurements of, for example, the, the CO2 to SO2 ratio at the surface, we can use this to track the ascent of magma from high pressure to low pressure. This figure on the right hand side shows uh, an example of this um, from a, a thermodynamic model. So you can see at depths of around 30 kilometers, uh, which translates to press of around 10 kilobar, uh, we have CO2 to SO2 ratio, it's very high, CO2 dominated, it's around 1000. As we then reduce the pressure, become shallower, this CO2 SO2 ratio reduces and most erupted compositions are around between one and ten but we can we can use this to our advantage from the perspective of monitoring so how can drones really help with this well in the obvious case they make these measurements safer for scientists we can make repeatable measurements without requiring getting up close and personal with vents such as this we can measure all volcanic gases. So unlike satellite-based techniques that can only measure uh, sulfur dioxide because it's negligible in background atmosphere, we can measure carbon dioxide, halogens, we can collect samples for, for isotopic measurements. We're not limited. The fact we can measure closer to the vent reduces any atmospheric effects. So our detection limits are much lower and we've reduced mixing and oxidation in contact with the atmosphere. So the measurements we make are more representative of the primary magmatic composition. And they can also be deployed rapidly at relatively low cost in an emergency. And this is compared to, for example, time in a helicopter, which can cost tens of thousands of pounds per day. So my first case study is based in Papua New Guinea, and this is somewhere I've been working for the past three years. This project is called ABOVE, uh, Aerial Based Observations of Volcanic Emissions. And this has been a, an internationally collaborative project uh, involving around 30 different researchers from nine different countries. And we were targeting three different phases of our project. Technological development. So some of the, the collaborators in the project were based purely in aerospace engineering. So this project really bridged the gap between traditional aerospace and physical sciences. We wanted to deploy our new technology at a volcano where we could really use this to gain new insights into volcanic degassing behavior uh, at a volcano where previously no gas ground-based gas measurements exist it's too high altitude it's too remote and then we want to work out how we can engage communities in allowing us to have long-term uh, gas measurements time series and, and help them to feel involved in the monitoring that 
contribute to kind of their own resilience. So to give you a quick background on Papua New Guinea, it's tectonics and active volcanoes. Uh, it's a very complex tectonic regime. Uh, there are many microplates all moving in different directions relative to each other. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, um, but predominantly it's dominated by oblique compression. Um, so we have uh, a volcanic arc called the, the West and South Bismarck arc running around New Britain, following the line of these islands and then along the northern coast of mainland Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is an extremely active arc with uh, many active volcanoes at the moment. I've highlighted uh, the major uh, active volcanoes in, in orange. And the fo focus of this, this talk will be Manam, which is shown by this, this orange star here. Now Manam uh, has uh, an explosive past. The, mo the previous major, major, major eruption was back in 2004 to 2005. Now here, pyroclastic flows descended along these four radial avalanche valleys that you see. The entire population that was around 8,000 people at that time were permanently re relocated to the mainland. Uh, they were forbidden, in fact, uh, by law to return to the island uh, for 10 years. So taken away from where is, is culturally and traditionally significant to them. After 10 years of, of relocation on the mainland to, to variable success, um, communities actively chose to return to the island uh, against uh, advice because it was so important to them. Although activity continued at a relatively low level for about another five to six years, uh, since about 2018, early 2019, activity has really picked up and there have been six major eruptions injecting gas and ash up into the stratosphere in the past 18 months. So it's a really critical time for working out both uh, how vulnerable the communities are here and what, what we can do in terms of additional science capability to, to help monitor this volcano in a more tangible way. Before I start this, I should mention um, I'm interspersing through this talk a series of video clips. Um, this is part of a longer 20 minute documentary that was put together as part of the above expedition. Um, if you want to see the, the full documentary, I can provide you the link at the end of the, the talk, but there are a few uh, excerpts just to set the scene. Uh, so this one should give you a, a brief insight into the overall scientific objectives of the above program. So this project is, is called Above, Aerial Based Observations of Volcanic Emissions. This project all the way from the beginning has been about pushing boundaries, pushing boundaries of how we study volcanic emissions, changing the way we take our measurements and how can we use the rapid advances in modern technology recently to help us get better data, fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge of volcanic emissions globally. Also how we can integrate lots of different techniques all happening at the same time. Volcanoes are the main recycler of carbon from the mantle to the atmosphere. What we want to know is how much of the carbon that comes out of a volcano is from the mantle and how much is from the subduction zone. And by looking at the isotopes, we can do that. We can then make a balance and understand how much of that subducted carbon actually goes beyond the volcanoes down into the deep mantle. So it's an important part of understanding the global deep carbon cycle. A more practical aspect of the project is to understand what is the volcano doing. The more things we can measure, the better it is for us to understand why volcanoes erupt and when they erupt. This is an instrument called the Multigas. These have been deployed on many, many volcanoes around the world and they play a really important role because changes in carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide chemistry are in the plume and the, and the ratio between them can be used to forecast volcanic unrest. So we put together this interdisciplinary team to develop sensors, sample collection systems that we can put on drones and fly into volcanoes. The idea was to measure carbon dioxide as we fly through the plume and in real time get the data back to the drone operator and then when the CO2 concentration is high enough we trigger a little pump that then takes the gas from the plume and puts it into this plastic bag. Then we take the plastic bag and 
analyze it for carbon isotopes. Yeah, oh, here you go. Yeah. Volcanic gas straight from the crater of uh, Tavuvu. We can all already look at the concentration. So the ratio between those two tell us about the carbon isotope composition. So carbon isotopes was, was just one of many measurements that were made as part of this interdisciplinary team. But in terms of pushing the boundaries of science more generally, what we were trying to, to achieve was these long range gas measurement missions. Never before had a, a flight over an active volcano been performed at distances of, of eight to 10 kilometers that we were flying. So we, we launched from a, a small town called Balial uh, down on the coast and uh, zigzagged up to the altitude of around 2000 meters ascent uh, and then did several traverses back and forth through the plume measuring in situ chemistry and collecting as you saw these these plastic bags uh, to measure back down on the ground the carbon isotope composition. From this we can learn many things about what is going on in the subsurface. These are a couple of images uh, from overpasses and we showed these to the communities living on Manam and seeing their reaction was, was incredible. It, this kind of view has never been, been made before. Uh, they were describing to us tales uh, of previous eruptions and what they observed, what they saw, but this was the first time that we could actually give something back in the other direction and, sh and show a view uh, of what the summit of, of their volcano was like. From the scientific perspective, this image was incredibly surprising, the one on the right. Now, we were not expecting magma to be quite so close to the surface as it was. We, we flew over, we could see incandescent material only a few hundred uh, meters from, from the, the surface. And this actually goes a long way to explaining why uh, the volcanic emissions were so strong at this point. Uh, and we could actually link the gas chemistry to um, the level of the magma column uh, and look at how it compared to what we would expect based on models. So even these visual images are incredibly powerful, um, especially to interpret our data in context. Emma, we've got a question in the chat from Martin Lorimer who wants to know, is there any concern about the heat and the drones? Ah, yes. Can I uh, answer that in a couple of slides time? I have a a dedicated video clip and slide. Yeah, sure. Because I was wondering that sort of thing myself about, you know, the kind of like, how they're adapted to be safe, the conditions with the gas emissions and heat and all, everything else that they're, I mean, you know, the situation. Yes, they're absolutely. That's such a good question. Now, I'll, I'll literally be there in a couple of seconds time, okay? <laughs> I'll just put you to them. So just uh, before I move on to some of the, the challenges associated with, with drone-based measurements, um, let's have a little look about what was on board. Uh, the different uh, analyzers that we had. So you've seen in the video these, these pumped bag sampling units. Uh, these are completely sealed and inert for isotopic measurements. And then this is a picture of the, the multi-gas analyzer. It's, it's definitely not pretty. It's not uh, necessarily parceled how you'd see a commercial instrument, um, but it's been developed um, from the ground up uh, by researchers. Um, we can measure carbon dioxide, SO2, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and then pressure, temperature, relative humidity. We also had something called a mobile DOAS, or a Differential Optical Absorption Spectrometer. Now, this is an upward pointing spectrometer that we can traverse linearly beneath the gas plume, and we can use the absorption of sunlight and the characteristic absorption patterns to quantify the amount of SO2 in a cross section through the plume. If we know the wind speed, we can then use this cross sectional concentration to derive the emission rate. So if we have, uh, measurements of the gas chemistry, so the CO2 to SO2 ratio. We know from independent measurements the SO2 emission rate. We can use these two in tandem to derive the emission rate of gas species that we cannot measure by spectroscopy, such as carbon dioxide. And these are images of the two different drones that we used. Uh, we had the multi-rotor for measuring the, collecting the pumped bag units and the fixed wing aircraft for uh, performing our in-situ gas measurements. Emma? Yeah. Can you hear me? It's Martin. Yes, I can. Hi. Yeah. In terms of the bag that takes the air sample, um, is that a one shot and you've got to reland it to take the sample or can the drone take multiple samples in flight or is it one at a go? Yes. So you see in the, the top right of this image, you can see four bags in series here. Um, 
works in parallel. Yeah, that, in parallel. So we can trigger each one independently. So in this case, we could take uh, four different samples at different points during the flight. Uh, so we're monitoring the gas chemistry. And as soon as we see a, a spike in SO2 that shows us we're, we're in the densest part of the plume, we can trigger one of these bags. We can then go to a different location, trigger another one if we wanted to look at the composition of a different vent, for example. Um, so yes, we can we can collect multiple samples in the same flight, but we do always have to bring them back to the ground uh, mm. to get the, the measurement. And, this one is a and I'm, I might be jumping the gun, but once you've got this data, I, I, I'm assuming would there be a way in the future to correlate um, future satellite imagery with the data that you're getting? So you don't have to do this. You could be able to infer things. So something we, we go in this project, it, it was multi-scale. Multi so we had ground-based observations drone-based measurements and satellite overpasses happening simultaneously. So we, we uh, tasked one of the, the satellites, Aster, and also Omi, to overpass at the exact point that we were, we were making our in situ measurements. Now, there's quite a long way to go before we can um, uh, completely make satellite versus in situ measurements comparable. Obviously, one is a, is a point measurement, whereas a satellite is measuring a, a column of gas through the atmosphere. But what we can do is now we have these measurements of, say, for example, the CO2 to SO2 ratio in hand, we can actually use uh, SO2 concentrations derived from satellites to, as you say, uh, infer things like carbon dioxide. We have to be a little bit careful because the gas chemical ratio uh, is dynamic and we can, it's a slightly circular argument in that we can use changes in the ratio to infer uh, changes in the magma storage conditions. So to take uh, essentially campaign measurements of uh, gas chemistry and use that uh, permanently to infer things from satellites, we just need to do use a little bit of caution. But yes, in situ measurements we can then use to expand the capabilities of more remote sensing approaches. And, and is it is it true that um, like aeroplanes, like that we would normally do, be doing journeys, aeroplanes actually have a lot of telemetry that gives data either to science and weather services. Is, is that a, 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 an old wives tale or? No, no, so mostly meteorological data. Um, so yes, uh, aeroplanes have a lot of, of meteorological data on board so they can feed into things like the Met Office's weather forecast, changes in weather systems. As far as I know, none has ever been fitted out with, with gas sensors and arguably they should never be close enough to the volcano to, to be measuring these gases. Um, but there is actually a program for volcanic ash called Sense and Avoid where uh, ash sensors or optical particle counters are being uh, installed on the, the front of, of aircraft uh, to measure particulate concentrations, uh, particularly for distal ash clouds, which uh, we're still working out whether or not it's, it's safe to fly. Um, so. Yes, aviation is, is getting involved in helping take remote measurements, but still for gas chemistry, we need to get much closer than commercial aircraft ever should be. Thanks. Okay, so the next slide is going to be another short video, and this is going to speak directly to the question we had a moment ago about some of the challenges involved in, in working with drones in volcanic environments and particularly in hot tropical environments. Um, I'll talk about some of these challenges after the video. Working in a country like Papua New Guinea, it's never going to be easy in terms of particularly logistics and just working in the field. But that's part of the reason why no ground-based measurements existed, because it's been extremely challenging. What we've got to remember is this is a remote island with no gas, electricity, water. So everything we're doing here is using the most basic facilities available to us. So we've bought tools, we've bought battery chargers. Charging was, is always the challenge, I think, on a trip like this. So many drones need so many batteries. Two different kinds of drone batteries charged, five computers, and we have two car batteries as well. We have some chaotic thing over here, but it works. All the drones, all the different types of instruments. I mean, everybody's working hard making it happen, but it's, you know, it's very, very ambitious. 
We're trying to push the boundaries. And when you push the boundaries, things will go wrong. It's challenging for the people who work here. It's challenging for the instruments. We've had instruments fail because of the heat. Well, uh, we were about to take off, but the, the computer shut down. It looks like it overheated. So the sun is, is really making a toll on the instrument. Once I had to put it in the freezer for a couple of minutes and then it worked again. At 34 degrees. Okay. No way, that's too hot. <laughs> People have been working really hard to push the vehicles beyond uh, their design capability. The sheer magnitude of the volcano, that sort of 2,000 metre climb, that's not something that most drones are designed to do. So getting all the way to the plume is, is definitely a challenge. Oh! You're down. That's a crash. Why is it so bad? Uh, no? It's the battery. So these are just a, a few insights of the trials and tribulations we had. You, you're actually looking at two locations there in case you're getting confused by the tall man arm and then suddenly we're on the crater rim. There are actually some, some footage from, from Rabal. Uh, but as you can see, that brings its own challenges with regards to precision flight. So I often get asked in, in talks about the, the technical environmental challenges. Uh, and I actually, one day I wanted some a mindless task to do. I went through all the, the literature that's been published on, on drones and their application to science. And I made this, this little uh, word map of the frequency of occurrences where different words are mentioned in a negative capacity with regards to drones. And this is what we came up with. So everybody complains about the wind. Uh, it's, it's still a major problem. Um, drones have a very well-defined wind envelope and unfortunately volcanoes are particularly notorious for having extremely windy summits. So even if it's safe to take off at ground level, you've got to be very careful that the wind speed is, is not exceeding the flight envelope of your vehicle at, at summit altitude. Uh, batteries, this is always a limitation. Um, for our measurements, we cannot use combustion engines, which would give us a much longer uh, flight duration of maybe hours or more. So we, we use lithium batteries uh, in the heat. These can be, well, at worst, inconvenient, uh, at best inconvenient, at worst, hazardous. Um, and they're also very limited. So we're pushing the boundaries of how long we can go and we're still only being in the air for maybe 45, 50 minutes tops. Acid is the, the third one I want to highlight. And actually the chemical corrosion of any metal components due to the, the combination of having SO2 gas, which uh, reacts and forms sulfuric acid, uh, plus a lot of uh, water vapor uh, in the air from the plume. So this reaction to sulfuric acid um, means that even after a single flight, a brand new shiny drone will come back almost completely rusted. So something that we're trying to do when we develop our custom designed vehicles uh, is that there are no exposed metallic components, uh, either made of carbon fiber or having conformable coatings sprayed wherever possible over the electronics. Um, the heat uh, is a, a specific problem to working in the tropical conditions, particularly for things like the ground stations, as you saw. Uh, iPads are the worst. Uh, so we're trying to keep everything under shade wherever possible. Um, keeps the operations moving. Um, so yes, there are, are many different challenges. Um, I hope that speaks to the, the question that was asked earlier. This final video excerpt, uh, this is showing you some of the, the, the contrasting occasions where things really go right. Now, this was capturing the, the first successful flight from the campaign. So this was, for context, uh, a year to two years of work leading up to this point. Um, weeks of transporting drones around, testing, uh, getting hot, hot and bothered, and then this is finally all paying off uh, for a successful. The first uh, challenge is the launch. So it's a hand launch. It's this moment when the vehicle goes to full thrust and you have to throw it into the sky and it, the autopilot takes over at that moment. And it's a very critical moment because the autopilot has to get the wings level, has to continue ascending, but shortly after that moment, everything becomes a little bit calmer. The thrust backs off, the autopilot's doing its job and starts navigating to the waypoints. Yep, off it goes. <laughs> That's good. That's good. 
When it goes into the turn, can you tell me what it recovers to? You said it at uh, maybe a 13 degree climb angle and it powers up in several large zigzag tracks, just back and forth into clean air until we reach 2,300 meters above sea level. Once we're at that, we fly directly towards the plume and we turn back. Yep. Okay, if it's 22.8, I am a go. Fantastic news. Ready? Right then has landed successfully in parachute mode. Disarm, please. Place this arm and confirm. So that was just an insight of, of the first flight. You can imagine uh, our excitement on the radios when uh, we were watching the data come in in real time. Now in this slide, I want to, to provide some really intriguing information and insights that are coming out from the engineering perspective, um, from simple flight data of what are the journeys experiencing in terms of XYZ acceleration and some really interesting energy uh, budget calculations. So you can see from the video here, it's, it's slightly sped up in time, but the gas is really pumping out at a high rate. This is highly turbulent, highly buoyant, um, and it's coming out in a very pulsatory manner. Um, so we wanted to really measure what kind of turbulence level was the, the drone experiencing, because as we were flying through, we were detecting upward accelerations of 20 to 50 meters per second. Now, if we convert this into to g force, which uh, we think about, this acceleration translates to effectively 2.5 G with transient excursions up to around 5 G. This is a lot for a foam aircraft to withstand. And um, actually, we're now redesigning a lot of our initial kind of design frameworks based on these measurements, because we had no idea it was going to be experiencing these kind of forces. And in fact, on, on the very last flight of the campaign, we, we lost a wing and uh, they watched the aircraft spiral all the way down into the lava lake. Um, but it's experiencing huge forces, uh, comparable to what you'd experience in some of those gravity drop rides uh, at the, the theme park, if you've ever been on one. Um, but from a, an energy budget perspective, um, although we are net neutral in terms of potential and kinetic energies as we go through, the actual gain of height uh, due to this thermal buoyancy of the plume as we, we fly through, followed by then the return of the drone to the level that's pre-programmed on its flight path, means that essentially we could almost remain up there indefinitely if we properly harvested this energy correctly. So as we perform single traverses, we are net positive in terms of total battery consumption. So this is something that we're exploring with the engineering colleagues, is whether we could create uh, a drone that's potentially got more glider-like uh, tendencies, and we can exploit this thermal energy to essentially overcome some of our battery limitations. Um, and this would mean that we could take measurements over much longer periods spanning different types of activity. So this is really exciting work. So some of the data that have come out of this, um, we were able to determine carbon, sulfur, water fluxes. We were measuring SO2 fluxes around 6,000 tons per day, which is huge. So if I put this into a bit of a global context, this was a recent compilation of SO2 and CO2 fluxes from volcanoes around the world. So Manam is a globally significant emission source. With the caveat, at least at that time during our campaign, volcanoes are known to fluctuate in intensity. Um, but to have 
previously no measurements uh, of CO2 flux at this volcano means that our estimates of, of global CO2 flux for the present day were, were missing a, a sizable contribution. I will uh, emphasize that data sets such as this from, a, from campaign fieldwork represent only snapshots in time. And we need to be moving towards long-term repeatable observations, um, which I'll speak to in a couple of slides time when I talk about our work with the communities. But you may be asking, why does this matter? Beyond the volcano monitoring application, what are the really the broad importance of this work? Well, this, this whole above campaign was actually funded through the Deep Carbon Observatory. So you heard in the documentary a lot of talk about the, the deep carbon flux and how much of the carbon is being returned to the mantle versus being emitted by volcanoes uh, along uh, volcanic arcs and subduction zones. So there's been a real push in recent years through programs like the Deep Carbon Observatory to quantify what is the current present day CO2 flux from volcanoes. And this is non-trivial given what I said that CO2 is actually very hard to measure due to the high concentrations in the background atmosphere and not being able to measure it via satellites. So from studies such as this and, and many others, we've been putting together a compilation and the most recent uh, estimate of global CO2 flux is 53.1 terograms per year. Uh, so for comparison, just to put this into a bit of context, uh, the CO2 in terograms per year from burning fossil fuels for energy and cement production is around 36,000. So just to put off any uh, um, questions about whether volcanoes are potentially contributing to global warming, this is not the case. It's definitely down to humans. But when we look back in time and we can couple these volcanic CO2 estimates to uh, paleo models of, of plate configurations uh, and look back over time, then, then volcanic CO2 flux has really been a, a key modulator of global climate and really getting a good handle on what the present day CO2 flux is uh, and then looking back in time and looking to the future. Uh, this is how we, we get a good handle on how volcanoes are contributing to global climate and how this resolves from anthropogenic influences. Hi Emma, we've got another question in the chat. It's from Peter Manning. He, um, well, he says, you've collected an impressive amount of data and knowledge. Can you convert it into a reliable prediction of eruption a couple of days in advance? A reliable indicator of eruption? A couple of days in advance. Yeah, okay, so Going back to what I, how I was describing in the slide about the theoretical change in, in gas solubilities and the fact that the CO2 to SO2 ratio is a, a really good indicator of magma ascent. Uh, volcanoes that are really well monitored and have continuous monitoring, such as Stromboli in Italy or Etna in Italy, uh, these are almost laboratory volcanoes. We have decades of measurements. And we've observed uh, between, between days to weeks ahead of major paroxysmal explosions, we've seen these excursions in CO2 to SO2 ratios. At other types of volcanoes, such as those that have a hydrothermal system or are covered by a, a volcanic lake, then different geochemical proxies, such as the sulfur dioxide to hydrogen sulfide ratio, can be a really good indicator for when the volcano is transitioning from a hydrothermal into a more magmatic uh, gas signature. And this can give indicators of unrest over timescales of months. So, We've actually shown a, a more than one, many volcanoes around the world, particularly of, of basaltic composition, of low viscosity magmas, that these geochemical proxies are extremely good indicators. Um, but the best way to provide actual warnings, maybe a few days ahead of time, is to couple these geochemical measurements with the other types of monitoring that I mentioned, such as changes in ground deformation, um, migrations of earthquakes and seismicity. So this is what volcano observatories are trying to do, integrate these multi-parametric observations to create more bulletproof forecasts of what, what may happen next. What this work is trying to do is, is make those kind of measurements more tractable. So there are many volcanoes that remain unmonitored, particularly for their gas chemistry, because they're simply inaccessible to traditional ground-based measurements. So although my work is not necessarily on the, the front line of engaging with, with policymakers and making these evacuation calls, uh, it's developing techniques for observatories to use in a more operational capacity, such as the Papua New Guinean Volcano Observatory. So we've been working with the Rabaul Volcano Observatory and then the 
regional disaster coordinators for different provinces in Papua New Guinea to provide both equipment and training and workshops into how to incorporate drone based strategies into both hazard monitoring and response. So uh, proactive uh, sampling campaigns to try and detect ahead of time these, these changes in gas signatures, but also when an eruption or a different crisis like a flood or a landslide does take place, how to integrate an aerial eye in the sky into the response effort to try and get a good handle on what the extent of the, the impact is very quickly. Uh, and we held a training workshop in Rabaul for uh, a week to 10 days for volcanological staff. And already uh, the government of Papua New Guinea has provided uh, almost match funding to provide equipment like, like this that we've provided to the Volcano Observatory. They've uh, provided this now to the regional disaster response coordinators who attended this workshop. Uh, so uh, although impact is always slow, uh, this is really a step in the right direction, not just for volcanology, but for, for hazard, uh, natural hazards more generally in, in Papua New Guinea. So I realize where time is marching on. So I just want to touch on my second case study, which is looking at a slightly different perspective. Uh, this is monitoring the effects of volcanic air pollution during effusive eruptions uh, rather than explosive like Manam is capable of. This is focusing on the 2018 Kilauea eruption in Hawaii. Um, this is a, a map on the right hand side showing where the fissures open up and then very quickly over a period of weeks, the lava infusion focused on this one fissure, fissure eight, and it covered this area covered by the, the, the red shading and in fact reached the oceans. So rather than just the hazards associated with the primary lava flow, we had this ocean entry, which volatilizes seawater, creates explosions and a, a very chlorine rich or uh, HCl rich plume, which poses its own hazards. So this is a, a few photos, uh, not my own sadly from the USGS, um, of uh, the fissure eight that, that localized. So, this one on the right hand side I find really striking because it, it shows the juxtaposition between an actively erupting fissure and just how close it is to, to roads and houses which people were occupying often only hours before uh, we had a flow breakout and the lava flow moved quickly. What I'm most interested in as a gas geochemist is images such as this where we can see the gases rising off the active flows uh, forming these large kind of pyrocumulus clouds and then this shading, this kind of almost, it looks like, it looks like drizzle on the right hand side, but actually this is aerosol deposition. So volcanoes, as well as the major gases, release metals like copper, zinc, lead, and these complex with sulfates and chloride aerosols uh, to be transported as aerosol particles, uh, micron scale aerosol particles, and then deposited either under dry deposition, they would simply deposit under, under mass or by wet deposition where they get incorporated into rainwater. And actually the deposition of these metals out of volcanic plumes, uh, we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of how important these are for water supply contamination, getting into soils, uh, the respiratory hazard. From the perspective of air quality, this image, or these two images on the right hand side show a contrast between um, the image of, of Mauna Loa, uh, also on Hawaii, about a few kilometers from the site of this eruption uh, on the top during the eruption and on the bottom about three to four months after the eruption ended. And uh, Mauna Loa is the site of uh, one of the, the longest running clean air observatories in the world. So this is where the, the famous Keeling curves of, of carbon dioxide increase uh, is coming from. So this is some of the cleanest air in the world. And this is the volcanic fog or VOG um, that is being produced by aerosol formation uh, during this long-lived eruption. So we were really interested in the air quality impacts of both the magmatic plume coming off the, the lava flows close to source and also how the gas chemistry and the, the metal uh, emissions changed with the, the lava flow ocean entry. So the main difference between the two is actually the, the lava flow ocean entry was, was more dominated by chlorine uh, with a high particulate concentrations as chloride. And the difference between having a plume dominated by sulfur emissions versus dominated by chlorine emissions is that different metal species, so between copper, zinc, lead, for example, they will preferentially complex with either sulfur or chlorine. So depending on which plume we were measuring, the 
metal load and thus the hazard uh, varied and really this is the first in situ measurements of a, a LAYS, uh, an ocean entry plume uh, that's ever been sampled. So this is really, really exciting work and would not be possible if we were not able to, to use aerial platforms as the closest uh, approach to these, this ocean entry was several kilometers away. This is a map showing some of the downwind plume processes that we're interested in. So Fisher 8, the source of the eruption is shown on the, the right hand side here. And then a major population center is Kona on the, the right hand side of the island. And this is where the, the main airport is located and most of the population. What we were observing in our in situ air quality stations around the country was actually that the air quality was being affected worse in Kona on the far side of the island than we were detecting close to the eruption site. And this immediately seemed extremely counterintuitive. But then when we coupled our measurements to a plume dispersion model that takes into account the unusual trade winds and how these interact with topography, it started to make a bit more sense. So the prevailing trade winds would take the, the gas plume, which was rising buoyantly above the eruption site. It was transporting it down towards the southeast at altitudes of one to two kilometers. This plume was aging. And then we were getting an almost boomerang effect where the winds were following the topography of Mauna Loa and circling around and getting stuck in the lee of the, the, the topography, et cetera, here on the, the western side and these gases were circulating around and, and having long residence times they weren't being dispersed into the atmosphere and although most of the emissions of sulfur in the form of SO2 sulfur dioxide gas what we were detecting with our measurement stations um, all the way from source to 100 kilometers downwind was that we were we were measuring the conversion the reactive conversion of SO2 gas into sulfate aerosol and sulfate aerosol is, is respirable uh, and can really trigger strong asthmatic attacks. So what we were seeing is the hazard is not necessarily uh, at its maximum close to source uh, and that the chemistry that changes in the plume as it ages even over up to 17 hours can change uh, the, the hazard that needs to be forecast. So this information was fed into the USGS's uh, daily alerts for, for air quality and actually as a result of this there are a lot more um, issuances of, of air quality alerts in Kona, as we, we now better understood the process um, of how, how plumes age and evolve chemically. And finally, this, this figure is, is quite detailed, so I won't take you through uh, all of it, but essentially each of these um, data points represents a different meta, metal or major element species that are emitted uh, by volcanoes and turned into aerosol. So this trend that you can see uh, in terms of refractory and volatile elements, uh, volatile being elements that prefer going into the, the gas phase, refractory elements prefer being in the solid. We see these linear depletions with distance from about three hours up to 18 hours. And this can be modeled and accounted for well by simple plume dilution and mass dependent deposition. But what was really interesting to us was this uh, initial change, dramatic decrease within the first two to three hours from Fisher 8 up here at one down to our first measurement station at Volcano. We observed this strong fractionation between refractory and volatile elements. This took quite a long time to, to work out until we came across a map of the, the rainfall abundance. And we started really thinking about how these metals enter, enter rainfall. Um, what we found was that close to source, there was a the level of rainfall is, is topographically controlled with more rainfall on the eastern side of the island than the western side. And actually it's the volatile elements will preferentially partition more strongly into water droplets than will these refractory elements. So it's actually wet deposition by rainfall and precipitation that's causing this dramatic uh, fractionation very close to source. And this is really important, particularly on Hawaii, because uh, rainwater is used as the primary source of drinking water. So uh, this was a rather worrying uh, finding that actually a lot of our metals are being sequestered uh, close to source, disproportionate hazard close to source, but in, in potential drinking water reservoirs. I just want to finish by uh, a couple of uh, images showing other aspects of where aerial measurements were being used uh, by the USGS and other groups uh, in an operational capacity during this crisis. 
So thermal maps from uh, thermal camera surveys were used to show uh, how lava flows were uh, crusting over and then where the likely breakouts were happening. So breakouts are really problematic from a hazard perspective because they're so unpredictable. If you start getting the end or the, the nose of the lava flow cooling and crusting, then where the next breakout will occur is extremely unpredictable. So these regular daily surveys are very helpful for that. We were able to measure the fusion rates and thus track the eruptive volume. And then we were also able to create uh, regular DEMs and much more uh, reliable lava flow forecasts, as I mentioned earlier in the talk. So just looking forward, I want to finish with a couple of three future directions that my research group and others are interested in. We're interested in smart technology, where we can use onboard uh, kind of algorithms and AI algorithms for allowing the, the drone itself to plume hunt intelligently. So often when we go to a site, it's not immediately intuitive where the, where the plume is. Unless we have strongly condensing conditions, a lot of the plume is actually invisible. So if we could have a drone that can incorporate uh, real-time measurements on board, process it, and actually hunt for the, the source of the highest gradient of gas, uh, this would be extremely advantageous and increase uh, a lot of autonomy and make it easier for observatories to incorporate this technology without the need for uh, extreme operator expertise. We're interested in drone deployable sensors. So rather than just relying on repeatable surveys and in situ measurements, we can actually drop off small sensors that will feed back either by radio or satellite telemetry um, in real time. And then volcano monitoring, increased automation to enable transfer to volcano monitoring observatories. This is really at the heart of what we're doing. We want to make a tangible impact and benefit by not just advancing our own science, but enabling communities such as Menam to work with their local scientists to continue the type of measurements that, that, that we were making and, and hopefully be able to take control of their own resilience. So I'm not going to read all these out, but I'll leave these on the, the slide for you to, to digest. Um, but essentially the drone measurements hold many advantages for the future of, of hazard assessment. And there's a lot more we can still develop. And it's, it's a very exciting field to be a part of. So thank you for having me this evening.